planning, man, you guys give me the exciting stuff, by the way. We're talking about strategic planning and all this other stuff. You get to talk about deer. Uh, strategic planning, we are also well on our way on that. I've seen uh, some, uh, some pretty good drafts coming from the staff here, and we've got our top priorities outlined, which we're going to announce here very soon. Uh, hoping to do that here at early October, so you'll have an idea of where we're going to be heading in as an organization. And so I, I will give you a little tease on that, though, and tell you that uh, don't get worried that we're going to be taking these gigantic steps and doing these strange things that you've never heard of before. We're staying really close to our roots and the things that have made us uh, successful over the years, over the long haul. And so you can look forward to hearing more about that very soon. Uh, fundraising. Many of you here represent branches uh, or help fundraise for us, do local fundraising. We, we certainly appreciate that. And as you know, and many others may not know here who are hearing this for the first time, uh, we're pro providing a lot more flexibility in how we fundraise going forward. So it's no longer a requirement, for example, that all branches hold a banquet like we traditionally have done. So we've really opened it up to new ideas, uh, things that you think may work better for you locally, and just to provide a whole, a whole lot more flexibility than we have in the past. So uh, that's all part of our, our uh, I guess, streamlining, our more modern approach here, and, and giving more, again, more authority back to you at the local level to sort of drive these things. That's not to say some won't still continue to do, to do banquets. Uh, some are very successful and they do well and people enjoy doing them. Uh, but uh, you're going to have more flexibility there, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we mentioned our sponsor this evening, OnX, and I'm happy to, and excited to announce that we have, uh, are very close to wrapping up a brand new deal with OnX. It's going to be a multi-year deal, so you're going to see their name a lot. Um, you know, not only are they a good partner because they give back to conservation and they care about it, they really are innovators in terms of the types of things they put in the palm of all of our hands now to help us become better deer hunters, better managers. And so they're just a company. Those are the types of companies we're going to align ourselves with, the ones that understand conservation, the ones that give back, and also the ones, like I said, that make, make the hunting process a little more fun and even a little easier in some cases. I know uh, I'm on my Onyx app just about every day as a deer hunter, and I've been on it a lot recently. So uh, excited to announce that as well, and we appreciate their sponsorship here this evening. Uh, another very exciting announcement, and there's been a lot of good news lately, so I'm, I'm happy to bring that to you. We are going to be hosting the 2021 Southeast Deer Study Group meeting. And so this is really, uh, when it comes to the, the science of whitetails and some of the best uh, researchers, uh, educators, students in the world that work on deer, the Southeast Deer Study Group meeting is it. I mean, if you're, if you're a deer nerd, besides, even if you're someone who just likes to shoot at deer, there's something for you as part of this meeting. And so um, it just be, at one point it looked like that meeting wasn't gonna happen because of COVID. This is usually a in-person meeting, uh, but we stepped up as an organization and said, you know what, we don't wanna see that happen. We wanna step in and we wanna offer to run this thing. And uh, the state directors uh, looked, uh, accepted our offer and said, yeah, we wanna give you a chance to do this. So we are excited. Uh, to really uh, spearhead this this year. We've already got the wheels turning. We've got a lot of work going forward. It's a lot of work to do this thing. But even more exciting is because we're going to this online format, this is going to open, open it up to any of you who want to participate and be part of this thing. So you're going to get to see firsthand some of the best deer research that we've always had a chance to see a little bit ahead of time and then we, we report it out afterwards. You're going to get a chance to be there and be part of it. So uh, please look for more information from us on that. This is just a, a tremendous opportunity for everybody. Um, and I want to mention too, it's, it's, it's really unlikely that we'll be doing things like our national convention or even the uh, uh, Whitetail Weekend. So this will really be uh, most likely your one chance to really have this national event. And again, this will be virtual and it'll be a chance for any of you to jump in and do that. So I would encourage, encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, we also, we're, we're continuing to form new branches, we're, which we're excited about. Uh, the Connecticut branch, uh, Western New England branch, and we have others right now in the process in Florida and Iowa. Um, people excited about joining us and, and being part of our mission going forward. Uh, we're just getting a lot of excitement overall about the, the merger of the NDA and, and, the, and the Quality Deer Management Association. Uh, people like what they're seeing, they like what they're hearing. And so we're excited about that too, obviously. And uh, it's just, again, all, all good news, positive momentum, and shows like tonight, for example, are, are a, a product of that. So uh, stay tuned for more. Uh, and of course, uh, we have our brand new webinar series that we're, that we're talking about here this evening. So uh, you've heard enough from me at this point. 
Uh, I want to turn it over to the team here, and uh, I'm excited uh, to, to see this. Cheers, everybody. Uh, enjoy this this evening, and, and definitely send us your feedback. You can also, I've, I've put this out uh, many times, but I'll say it to this group. Uh, it is going to be part of our culture uh, that we have direct connection with all of you, our membership, and that, and that starts with me. Uh, so if there's anything you want to send directly to me, you can you can pick up the phone and call me, or you can just email me at nick at qdma.com. I would love to hear from you, love to hear your ideas and what you're thinking out there. And, and actually, what I would love more than any of that is for you to send me your deer pictures, uh, because that gets me excited. I'm a big time deer hunter like all of you are, and so uh, I love doing that as well. So with that, uh, turn it over to you guys. All right. Thank you, Nick. And uh... So, uh, hey, I got a, a chat feature here that folks are saying that they're not able to chat with anybody except me or Matt. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, nobody wants to chat with Matt. I totally get it. But uh, feel free to send me your stuff. Uh, we have the setup, and it, my computer says that uh, all attendees can chat with everybody else. That obviously is not the case. So uh, while Matt uh, starts talking here, I'm going to work on this, see if I can get this fixed so that you can chat with each other, and uh, we'll see if I can make that happen. But uh, I'd like to take a minute to thank uh, Terrapin Brewing Company out of uh, Georgia. The good folks in Georgia have uh, actually uh, sent me uh, a beer to drink tonight during this. Uh, they didn't send it to Matt. Um, being that Matt is from New York, uh, they're not allowed to accept uh, the good beer from the good folks at Terrapin Brewing. So uh, I'm glad that I live in a good state of Pennsylvania and, uh, and I'm able to get that. But uh, that's what I'll be sipping on as we go through here. So uh, um, I've known Matt a long time. And, uh, and I'll say this, I have an opportunity to work with Matt. We hired him back in 2006. So uh, it's been uh, with us for a while. Um, I'll show you a couple things here. Matt is a certified wildlife biologist. Um, he's also a licensed forester. We've taken big advantage of Matt over the years. Uh, many of you that have been at Deer Steward classes, uh, you've seen Matt. Uh, he started out uh, kind of as a, as a modest role. Um, here uh, we used to have him hold props for some of our speakers, uh, the more popular ones like Dr. Harper that you see here. So uh, Matt did that for a long time. He could hold tables up, he'd hold books up, all kinds of stuff. Uh, given that he's not, in addition to being a certified wildlife biologist, he's a licensed forester, we thought he definitely has more uh, incentive than, than just holding books. So uh, being a forester, he ended up graduating up to holding uh, polls for, for some of the other speakers. This is the Deer Steward class that we did at uh, Lee and Tiffany Lukoski's uh, several years ago. So uh, Matt wanted to jump in here. This actually was a rubbing pole. That, uh, that Lee was talking to the students about how he uses these to track deer into some of the stand setups. So uh, Matt, feeling you know that he was in the, in the in crowd as a QDMA member, it kind of jumped in there and pushed Lee out of the way and uh, asked everybody to take his picture uh, holding this. So uh, I guess that's the forester in him. But uh, we let it go because uh, Matt doesn't have a lot of other friends. So uh, we wanted to, to definitely make him feel at home, and he did here. And uh, so uh, that kind of brings us to where we are today. Uh, Matt hasn't graduated a lot farther than, than holding the polls here. But one thing that he is very good at is he is a great researcher. And uh, that really pulls in to what we have tonight. Matt is going to share with you now the 20 biggest deer research stories. And I'll say this. He is a good researcher. He is a good speaker. He's really good at holding props. So if any of you come to a deer steward class, future uh, big educational event with us, you have something you'd like Matt to hold for you, by all means, he is well experienced. So. Uh, Matt has been with us uh, literally since 06, long time. He knows a lot of the people on what we have here tonight. So uh, you are in for a treat. You know he's a good presenter. So uh, Matt, I'm going to kick it back over to you. I'm looking forward to this as well. I'm going to make uh, critical notes here. Anything you mess up on at all, I am going to record on my paper to pick on you tomorrow. And of course, we're recording this whole thing. So uh, all the good folks that can't be with us tonight and may see this later, will have a chance to see as well. So uh, with that, uh, Go ahead, give us your title slide, and take it away. All right, Kip, I appreciate it. Uh, I'll hold a prop right now. I'll hold myself a little beer. Uh, I th saw that coming since the last time we had uh, a, a town hall meeting with all our branches. I gave Kip a, a whooping on age this, and he's just been sore ever since. So I'm <laughs> sorry that happened. But So, uh, folks, uh, really excited to give this presentation to you. Um, this is actually a talk that I gave at the Whitetail Weekend event in March as COVID was hitting and certainly that affected attendance and we were talking about what we wanted to do for the first presentation of this webinar series and we decided that why not give that a lot of folks could not make that event because of COVID um, so 
it was a it was a great topic. Spent a lot of time researching uh, to give that presentation, and so we called it the 20 biggest deer research discoveries of the last de decade. It actually started as an idea while we we're thinking of topics to give at the Whitetail Weekend of the 20 biggest deer research discoveries of the last 20 years. It was a play on 2020 uh, for the year and realized just how much research has come out in the last 20 years and it quickly got turned into uh, the last decade. So a couple of ground rules before I start the presentation and get into some of the topics. Um, one, you know, obviously this is subjective. I went through uh, volumes and volumes of uh, research that we presented on through different conferences and proceedings that we've attended. And I just tried to pick things that I thought were affecting the average deer hunter or landowner the, the largest, but that doesn't slight any of the other great research that's come out. Uh, certainly a lot of really good uh, studies and researchers at the college and uh, level. Um, there's also, this is about whitetails. Uh, you know, QDMA historically is a whitetail organization. So I stayed clear of anything that had to do with elk or mule deer or any other uh, cervid species and just focused on whitetails. So it comes from a bunch of different sources, but primarily what I did was we attend all of the major regional conferences. Nick was just talking a few minutes ago about the Southeast Deer Study Group meeting. We attend that. Um, we, as an organization, always send staff to the Midwest Deer and Turkey Conference. We send folks to the Northeast Deer Technical Committee. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be one of the staff members that attends mo most of those regional events and get to hear about the research that's presented all those. So I started there and started looking at everything from 2010 to today, or at least until March, and sorted through all that and tried to decide what made the most sense to, to utilize. I also then try to give a balance. Um, obviously, there's lots of different topics when you look at the world, world of deer research. So this will range from anything that has to do with herd dynamics and productivity, um, things taking them out when they're younger or killing them when they're older, um, things that have to do with deer behavior, um, all, habitat management, of course, that's important to many of us, and certainly what hunting impacts it might have, good or bad. Um, and there's a lot of research in the last decade that's actually come out about our influence on deer movement and whether or not um, we're, we're having an advantage or disadvantage to what our techniques and tactics are, are playing. So I try to provide a balance to all of that. So let's just jump right into it. So we got 20 things to talk about. The first, I just figured, why not talk about hunting, something related. And just a couple of years ago, University of Georgia researcher Aaron Watson determined what's called the flicker fusion rate of deer. So basically what that is, is how quickly they process visual images. Think about as we're watching the screen right now, you're seeing a series of still photos and you make it into a film. Deer can actually do that at a lot faster rate than we can. So they're playing the role of film in a much faster, and they're receiving and processing those visual images much, much faster. What that means is they can react more quickly, um, and they're also more sensitive to any movement that's happening while you're out in a field. So if you're in a deer stand, for, uh, for an example, or you're stalking deer, and you move any motion that's happening, they can process it faster, almost like it's in slow motion. Now that's true at all times of day, but what's really interesting is Aaron found that it's greatest at dun, 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 sunrise and sunset. That's when they're most active, that's when they're most vulnerable, um, and they can actually process that at four times greater than we can at that time. So take home message from that is, if you're hunting or when you're hunting, I'm sure everybody on here plans to be out if you're not already, um, just move incredibly slow because deer can take those images and process them fast. Number two, you are what your grandparents ate. So just a few years ago, 2015, uh, Eric Michael at Mississippi State University discovered um, through a, a process called epigenetics or a, a phenomenon called epigenetics that deer actually aren't genetically doomed to have smaller bodies or antlers their entire life or their offspring's life. They're actually a, are a product of their environment. And so this study happened again in Mississippi. What they did was 
they captured fawns, um, so they knew the age. They, they were uh, the first firstborn fawns of the year for several years in a row from three different physiographic regions in the state of Mississippi. Really good soil and productive area, kind of a middle and one that's really poor. And they brought those deer back to uh, the research facility. They raised them there. They fed them a really high quality uh, forage for a whole for their life and monitored what changed after one generation and two generations and actually going on to three generations to see if they took deer from these different regions, if things changed, if they were, if they were all given an equal diet. And you can see the graph there kind of in the center of the screen, there's a very distinct variation to the three different regions in terms of body size or weight and antler score. So what happened? Well, after a generation, you can see that uh, there really wasn't much change. There was a little bit of a change. Well, let me go back a slide. It jumped ahead there. Well, it's skipping ahead. Anyway, after, after two generations of it, you could see that there were uh, significant differences, but it took some time for that to occur. There, you could see that at the body weight, after three, three years, so two generations, the deer in the lower quality region, the LCP, actually caught up to the original deer size on average, this is for, for bucks, by the way, um, that were caught in the best soil region. So after two generations, they actually were equal um, with those original uh, deer. In terms of antler score, you can see that actually antler score all equaled out. So deer from the best quality region and even the poorest quality region, just after two generations, they were, they were all caught up with each other. So kind of the take home message there is you can't doom a deer or even a region. You can't kind of look doom and gloom in terms of I live in this part of this state or this part of this province and I'm just doomed to have smaller deer. Well, that's not true. If you can change forage and nutrition over a period of time so that they're all raised in those areas, they can actually increase in both antler size and weight. Speaking of weight, uh, number three, fat bottom bucks, you make the world, rock and world go around. So in 2013, there's a couple of cool studies here. Um, Dave Hewitt, Dr. Dave Hewitt with uh, Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute at Texas A&M &A Kingsville found that heavier bucks in rot more likely, are more likely to be, breed because they don't need to eat as often. And what they found was most of the energy that deer use um, comes from their body reserves during the rut. And the fatter they go into the rut, particularly shorter, really intense ruts, it enables them to devote more time to breeding. So the more healthy the deer herd, the more healthy the habitat, the more heavier on average per age class those deer are going to be, the more likely they're going to be able to utilize those resources and will not uh, take away from their ability to survive and actually uh, um, recoup afterwards. A similar study only a year after that, Chad Newbolt and his colleagues at Auburn found something similar, but they found that regardless of age or antler size, bigger bucks won, won the right to breed more often. So they measured physical characteristics on a bunch of bucks, 262 of them over seven years. They collected genetic samples um, and then they followed those, those deer and the offspring and assigned paternity to them. And what they found was that body size was the most important factor in terms of assigning that parentage. So anything that was, was buck size or antler size, they did not find any similarity there. So between those two studies, what we learn is the heavier these deer are, the more time they can allocate to breeding, and the more likely they're going to have that right to breed. Makes sense. But we also know that antler size matters too. Um, just a couple of years ago in 2018, again, Mississippi State, Daniel Marina reported that buck age and body size, when they're equal and attitude is removed from the equation, antler size can be a significant factor in doe mating choice. Um, and guess what? Bigger is better, at least in this study. What they did, really neat study. They, ca they have captive bucks. They have the ability to segregate them into different pens with different does. They sawed off the antlers, which is very uh, typical in these research facilities, um, and they were able to interchange with kind of this um, system, mechanically attach antlers of different sizes to bucks that were all the same age and rough, roughly the same weight. So all mature bucks that were four or all mature bucks that were five were then able to swap out different antler sizes. And then 
he would assign them or put them nearby does that were in heat um, to see and give her an option of one that had really large antlers or one that had really small antlers and found that almost 90% of the does in this study chose to hang out with the larger antler buck when given a choice. So for shame, you know, I'm not sure about that. All right. Number That's five. Just you're short. That's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Number five, don't be late. Hey, you're 10, just so you know, I'm your timekeeper here. You're 10 minutes in and only on number five. So uh, you might need to pick the pace up just a little. Well, thanks for starting me at 7.20, <laughs> by the way. All right, don't be late. Uh, Mark Turner from Auburn reported that late bursts from late ruts lead to lower productivities for younger does. So what they found was when you have a late rut, those does are going to be breeding out later. They saw a 16% decline in pregnancy for yearlings, though most recovered by two and a half years old. Number six, Johnny on the spot, or even the little guys win. Aaron Foley with Caesar Clayburg found that even when you have a well-balanced age structure, so you have bucks in all age classes, young, middle, old, um, still a third of the breeding occurs from the younger bucks, adult bucks in this study. Um, you know, so about 33% were assigned to either one and a half year olds or two and a half year olds. So even if you do all this QDM and you're uh, getting deer into older age classes, some of the breeding is still going to occur from those younger age classes. Um, they were more successful, obviously, when there were not many mature uh, males present, but they, they surmised or, or assumed that some of these younger bus, bucks might be a little bit more sneaky, uh, employing what they called alternative breeding strategies when that competition is high to try to get in there and breed those and get those opportunities. One interesting thing though is right after that, another study out of Auburn found that in the same sort of study, even in well-balanced age structures, even button bucks contribute to a certain percentage of uh, the breeding. Um, the researcher there, Pete Acker, called it the Justin Bieber theory, where the, the six-month-old button bucks were, were uh, performing some of the breeding activity. But this is, in essence, something to take home. Not much you can do on a management scheme, but uh, know that even if you do this a lot of work and get deer into older age classes, they do balance. And one of the ways that balance happens is diversifying breeding stock and where that comes from. Number seven, soil impact quality impacts yield, not nutrients. A couple years ago, uh, Dr. Harper presented at our convention a topic called influence of soil nutrients on plant nutrition for white-tailed deer. And he started by saying, when you have poor soil, it equals poor nutrition, right? In fact, I just showed a slide a couple of minutes ago showing that in Mississippi. Well, he went out to show that that was actually wrong. A lot of us look at the national map of the U.S. and see where the best soils are, and we think where the biggest bucks are coming from, but we automatically think better soils must equal more uh, better nutrition, right? Well, Dr. Harper and his students did a really neat study where they collected plant samples from around the country where all those stars are in different soil regimes, green and blue really good, red and orange really poor, and collected plant samples from those regions and soil from right next to where those plants were and measured the nutrient capacity of all those plants. And they found that a pokeweed is a pokeweed is a pokeweed. It didn't matter if it was in class one, basically sandy soils as white as sugar or the darkest loam class five, they all had the similar percentages of nutrients, crude protein, phosphorus, calcium. So just looking at those plants, you can't say it's growing on poor soil. It must have poor nutrients, which equates to poor uh, antlers. That's kind of one of those moments where really, we always thought poor, uh, better soil equaled bigger antlers. What he did find though, is it impacts yield. Where the best soils are, you have really high yields. You can see this, this is ragweed on one of the better soil places. And here's ragweed, again, same percentages in nutrients um, in a poor soil and just doesn't produce so much volume. So pretty interesting. Yield, more food, more food per mouth, per bite. Those deer have more nutrition overall and they can, they can grow bigger antlers. As part of that study, um, they also looked and found that young plants and forbs are really important. And they found that these plants in particular um, have much higher nutrients than some of the more woody plants. And I'll show you a graph here that's pretty interesting. Um, 
you can see the percentages there across the, the left to right. Forbs and younger plants are on the left. What more woody species are on the right and protein is in the red bar. And you can see some of those other nutrient, uh, macronutrients there are in the lines tending to show you that the more young the plant is or the more uh, less woody it is, the more nutrients it are. So one of the things that's interesting is that we found that it, when things are limited, we contend that you need more forbs, you need younger plants, so you need to do a lot of disturbance, you need to manage those properties and get those plants growing. So if you wanna really elevate nutrition, get younger plants, have that turnover a lot faster and try to get more forbs out there. Number eight, um, open up the sky. Big sky country, not just Montana. A couple studies here, 2011, Marcus Lashley um, at the time with UT and Mark Turner, who I think I saw his name on there when I was cruising through the names before from Auburn in 2020, both collectively across a couple studies found that by opening up the canopy, a mere 30%, so less than a third, um, girdling, spraying, using kind of some kind of improvement uh, on the forest, not really opening up a lot, and trying to kill trees in place or, or drop them, um, you can actually see an increase of, of biomass of deer forage of almost 500% or more. Um, both of these studies involved low intensity fire, but that graph right there is from the 2011 study, just showing you that with an improvement cut, how much more nutrition is shown after some of those treatments in pounds per acre. Number nine, Jared Brook, uh, also with UT, a lot of habitat management or research coming out of UT in the last decade, found, did a really cool study to tell us whether or not fertilizing oaks helped. Um, what they did was over 10 years, uh, they followed 120 white oaks in East Tennessee, and they had four different treatments, a control where they did nothing, they fertilized some oaks, they opened some oaks up and just crown released them, and then they also did a crown release with fertil fertilizer. And what they found was a couple things. Um, only 40% or roughly 40% of the trees, trees produced more than 70% of the acorns. Um, a crown release, just opening it like you see in the picture there, uh, compared to untreated trees actually produce a 65% increase in acorn production. So just opening it up without fertilization really helps. And they also found that fertilizing oaks did not produce more acorns than the untreated trees. Um, so a lot of really cool take homes there. You don't need to spend money on fertilizer. That was one of those uh, misnomers for years is you got to fertilize those oak trees to get more acorns. And re reality, what it is is sunlight based and you get the benefits of understory forage, soft mass, fawning cover, all that young forb growth that we just talked about a couple of minutes ago. Halfway Good through, job. Kevin. Uh, Jared is actually here with us tonight, so I'm really glad that you got that correct. That's good. That's good. I texted him. I texted him early and told him that he was going to be featured tonight. He better show up. And he said, because I guess I need to be on there. Then I said, well, you got to drink beer if you're coming. So, all right. Number 10, halfway through, don't mow those food plots. Another UT study giving us some habitat management advice. Bonner Powell found that mowing food plots provides little, if any, benefits with regard to nutritional quality or digestibility for deer. I cannot tell you how many people I've been watching on social media over the past couple weeks where people are out there mowing their clover saying, give it in the last haircut of the year, just shaking my head thinking, you guys are just losing all that biomass because what... Bonner did was measured alfalfa and red clover perennial plots um, and found that on average mowing them reduced the biomass 23 and 30 percent respectively. Just absolutely took all that food away and saw no increase in the nutrients in the plants. So it wasn't making them sweeter, wasn't making them more nutrition, nutritious. It was just taking away a bunch of food. And it's amazing to me how many hunters that do that, that plant food plots will go out there and basically mow away almost a third of the money they put in and the food that they're trying to produce for the deer. Um, so his suggestion was to only mow at the end of the summer or as necessary to reduce weeds um, and, and maintain it. Got to slip in a 10B. I did this a few minutes ago at number seven, kind of my way to get more than 20 in here. There was some research done right at 2010 that showed the benefits of food plots to non-game species. Um, had to about 40 sites across the south and north. This was done from UGA. Uh, they measured birds, 
uh, detections in and out of the plots and nearby. They measured small mammals in and outside the plots and nearby, measured species richness and abundance. And what they found was the creation of food plots in a um, northern hardwood forest um, that was previously closed canopy actually saw a benefit in the biodiversity of non-game species. So for any of those folks out there that argue with you that hunters are only in it for themselves, this is a great study that you can cite and say, well, actually all the work that we do benefits all kinds of game and non-game species and this one proves it. So, so we're halfway through. I got to do my shameless plug for uh, my coworker, Hank Forrester. Um, we have a, a program that you can take, anybody, seasoned veteran, uh, brand new hunter. It's designed for anybody that's in, interested in learning about deer, deer biology, deer hunting strategy through Calchemy. It's called Today's Hunter. Um, there's a promo code there on the screen, G1QDMA2020. Um, you can share that with people that you may know that want to learn to hunt and it saves you $5 off. It's like a 10 hour class and it's pretty inexpensive to begin with. Um, it's a great online class. I encourage you to, to take it. We've had over 20,000 people take it so far. Um, and it's just deer hunting 101. Learn, learn the basics of deer and how to get started. And even if you're a veteran, you'll learn something from watching it. All right, Kip, I'm on the home stretch, number 11. The blob is real. What is that? Well, I'm talking about CWD. I couldn't talk about research over the last decade and not talk about CWD. But before we jump into what we've learned, I thought it would be good to show you guys how much of it spread in the past uh, decade and why I'm calling it the blob. So that's what CWD distribution looked like in 2010. Um, the gray, dark and light gray are counties that were CWD positive in, in a decade ago. And the little dots are places that are found in a captive situation. So fast forward to 2012, you can see some growth. 2018 and by 2020. This thing is definitely spreading. Um, we have not been able to stop it. We have not really been able to slow it down and that's why I call it the blob. Hello, my name is CWD. But what have we learned about it? I mean, it's not that new of a disease, but we're still learning a lot. Um, for those of you that don't have Onyx who's sponsoring tonight's uh, webinar, that there is a layer on OnX. If you haven't turned it on, I would recommend that you do that uh, highly. If you don't have OnX, I'd recommend you go get it because like Nick, I use it all the time. There's a layer, a QDMA layer on there that you can actually turn on the same map that I just showed you and see every county that has CWD. And QDMA is responsible for updating that in real time. Kip actually does that. Every time a county becomes positive, he lets them know, they update it, and it gets turned on in their database. So um, one of the best resources to find out where CWD is right now. Um, so what have we learned? We've learned, it's in the last 10 years, different ways that it spreads. I mean, it's been around since the 60s. The first, the first discovery was in 67, but we're still learning ways that it spreads. Um, we've learned uh, that it does make populations go down. There have been studies since 2010 following populations for a long time and seeing population decreases. We see that deer that have it die faster than deer that don't. And that may be one of those things that say, okay, that makes sense, but it just makes them more vulnerable and it's three times the rate as uninfected deer. Um, that's not good and that's why population declines are happening. Um, we know that some of the ways that's passed around between deer varies. Um, and that, that helps for us to be able to slow it down, but we're learning more. Um, plants can actually uptake and transport the prions from infected soil. So that's scary in terms of where deer are that have it. It can defecate, it can go in the soil, other deer can get it, something that we've learned. Um, same thing with mineral eggs. They, they serve as reservoirs, which is why a lot of states and provinces outlaw that. We've learned that does, adult does, are 10 times more likely to be CWD positive if they have one that's a relative nearby, just because they're so familial, they, they stay in those groups and they're gonna pass it. And one of the reasons why QDMA continues to promote um, balanced deer harvest and not just thinking about bucks around CWD and trying to take more does out because they pass it at such a high rate. Um, CWD can in, experimentally affect, this is in experiments, things that have human genes associated with it and trying to test whether or not that might eventually pass to us. There's been conflicting evidence of, there was some research that came out that showed um, some uh, primates, uh, macaque monkeys that actually ate infected uh, venison became uh, 
CWD positive or at least f uh, came positive with the prion. Um, but then some other research came out afterwards that said that's not true. So that's, that's conflicting if you ever are heard any of that. The good news is, is we've learned some good things here. And just in the last year or so, uh, there's a new gene targeted approach, um, allowing scientists to really better understand how genes may play a role. And that actually plays into species barriers. Um, we know that elk and deer uh, react and detect a little bit differently. So I'm expecting and we're expecting more to be coming out about that and how that might help us slow the rate. Um, just June of last year, a study revealed that some subpopulations of deer are actually more susceptible than others. That's interesting. Um, if you hadn't heard this last fall, just shy of a year ago, some scientists found that a simple five minute soak in bleach can neutralize the CWD prions in, on stainless steel equipment. That's interesting. And then uh, March of this year, just when COVID hit, there's some promise shown with CWD testing, which is one of those big limiting factors. Um, it's a bottleneck um, that may be able to show in a, in a a positive result in as little as nine hours. Right now it takes weeks to kind of get results. So that's showing promise. And there was another study that showed uh, we may be able to pick up deer pellets, deer, deer poop out in the woods and tell whether or not that deer had CWD. So some pretty, pretty interesting and good, good news coming out about CWD. Number 12, deer go on vacation. On occasion, they do. Um, I gave a talk about this a couple of years ago. What we're talking about, of course, is excursions. This is when deer leave their home range for a certain period of time. Lots of research has been done on this. In fact, I saw uh, Andy Olson on, on the list of names too. He's one of the researchers listed here. Um, bucks and does both go on excursions. Collectively, this research has shown in the last 10 years. It's well documented all over the country. It's not just a regional thing. It's just not happening in Texas or the South or the North. It happens, believe it or not, year round. It's not just a rut related thing. It's found in all age classes and in fact starts even as young as one and a half year olds. Now we know that yearling bucks go on something called an excursion, um, but almost 80%, I'm sorry, on they all, yearling bucks go on a dispersal. I know Kip is gonna catch me on that. Um, okay. Will disperse from their home range permanently, but 80% of them actually go on an excursion where they leave their home range and then come back before they disperse. Um, so compared to dispersal, um, that was found that it was uh, lesser average distance move. So they didn't go as far, they went faster. Um, their path was more complex. So there's thought that it might be a failed dispersal. They went out trying to find a place to disperse um, and then came back. They weren't really comfortable with that direction. But the thing is, it's still happening in all these other age classes. And I'll give you this great summary of what we know. About 50% of bucks two or older go on excursions. It is slightly more in the fall, but half the bucks do and half the bucks don't. It seems to be based almost on personality. Of the ones that do, about half of those go on more than one event. Um, they average about one and a half miles outside their home range, but it varies, could be up as, as high as eight, nine, 10 miles. Um, and it's under a day that they're gone. Uh, but again, it, it varies. So this happens, we know that. Um, and it's one of the cool things that we've learned about through GPS research in the last decade. Number 13, X marks the spot. See what I did there, Kip? On X that. with the logo. Aaron Foley with C C Caesar. Thank you, thank you. Aaron Foley with Caesar Clayberg reported that bucks likely space out their travel uh, to assess female receptiveness. And it's something we've always wondered as hunters is if I sit where I'm seeing a lot of does, are, are bucks going to come by? Well, duh, yes. But did we see that? Did we prove it? Um, they found that bucks did not wander randomly. They weren't just running around like crazy. They are, but it wasn't random. Um, they actually only used 30% of their home range during the peak rut. And most bucks in this study that had GPS collars on them went to two or more what they called focal points within their home range. And they average about 60 to 140 acres in size. And they just repeatedly go, went back to those same focal points every 20 to 28 hours. So yeah, I mean, what we're thinking was that they are finding does and they're just re repeatedly coming back when those does are receptive and ready. Um, especially what was interesting on the study, several bucks would overlap on the same places and they had bucks on multiple bucks. They had collars on multiple bucks in the study. So they saw that happening. Number 14. Well, guess what, folks? You messed up. 
uh, yeah, we're talking about can you overhunt your area, uh, your stand or wherever you're going? You can. And one of the neat things that's shown in the last decade and deer research, especially this GPS stuff, is that it happens. We saw a decrease in daylight use when areas are overhunted. This is an example um, from Clint McCoy. Um, study was done uh, in North Carolina um, at Brosnan Forest, and they saw a decrease in daylight use on a hunt in spots. And then this is Jim Stickles with University of Georgia saw again, a decrease in daylight use. You can see daylight use of certain plots uh, or places where people were hunting in October through November there on the right. And the amount of orange bars is daylight and how that uh, decreases over time. Actually that reversed those two slides, but um, yeah, what we're seeing is definitely decrease in daylight use. Uh, also, we found that in other studies, Andy Little, Clint McCoy, uh, Kevin Wiskirchen uh, with Auburn shared with us how many days it takes for a stand to recover. Um, they found that this is a study done in Oklahoma through MSU and the Noble Foundation, Andy Little, that there are different elements of where that threshold is. Um, it, at 100 per couple hundred acres, they didn't really see an impact, but at 100 for every, say, 75 acres, there was an impact. Deer changed the way they moved. They moved differently. They used more cover. Um, they changed their path. They, they weren't in daylight as much. Um, and both, all of these studies basically summarize that hunting pressure um, makes deer change very quickly, but deer will return to normal in three to four days. Pretty interesting. Uh, we also learned on predators that sometimes when you take predators out of the equation, it works. A couple studies here right around the, the turn of the decade there um, had really low fawn recruitment of about 0.4 fawns per doe. They removed a bunch of uh, predators, namely coyotes, and they saw a change, a big increase. But then we started seeing some research coming out that showed that it didn't. So sometimes it worked, sometimes it doesn't. The study on top there, particularly John Kilgo, um, was an interesting study. They had 8,000 acres and they removed 474 coyotes in three years off of 8,000 8, acres. Um, they had collared fawns, they monitored survival, and they just saw this as the coyote index decreased, this fawn survival on the right going up and down, up and down, and they really didn't have a good feel of what was going on there. And there was lots of literature coming out around the mid uh, 2000s on what was happening, why was some of it happening and why was it some of it not. And we really started to shine a spotlight on it around then when the something called the Tri-State Coyote Project was done. Joey Hinton from UGA learned that um, they, they some coyotes function at much, much larger spatial scales than what we previously thought. I mean, this is a map of a movement of one coyote across the southeast, um, about 2,500 square miles in that case. So they took this study, and what they wanted to learn is um, how are they really structured? And they found that about a third of coyotes are what we call transients. They never set up a home. They just continue to move, move, move. And about two thirds of them are known as residents. They do set up homes. Um, residents tend to have much smaller home range, so about a square mile or, or there uh, in lar about. Um, larger transients can be very, very large. This is one of the big ones, 60 to 70 square miles in this one coyote. Um, so you can imagine if you're trapping coyotes, like in some of those examples that are transients, you're, you're always going to find other coyotes fill that space because they're constantly moving and, and, and filling that void. Um, so depending on what coyotes you remove is gonna depend on whether or not you can have an effect. Um, overall, the project showed that it does vary um, across a year, in fact. Uh, coyote packs can average about 600 pounds of, of venison or deer in their diet, but it ranged from very low to very large amounts per pack. And the take home there was that this variance across the landscape um, will really depend on your management regime and what you do. So we talked a lot about predators in the mid 2000s um, and now we know a little bit more about why uh, some of it worked and some of it didn't. Number 16, in some cases, even when predators aren't there, fawns are still dying. Um, and that's just part of life and death. Uh, Justin Dion from University of Delaware uh, now, if folks that aren't from uh, that part of the country, Delaware was one of the last places and basically is in absence of predators. Coyotes don't 
exist there, very, very few bobcats. Um, so they basically had a perfect conditions to, to see what fawn survival was right, like. And in that study, they, they captured a bunch of fawns, 109 of them over two years, put collars on them, uh, followed them for three months, those, those really vulnerable times, and they found less than 50% of them survived with no predators in the population. Um, they just haven't been documented like at all in the counties that were there ever. And they found the greatest factors for survival in those cases were doe age. So the more mature a doe, the more instinct she had in raising, birth weight and weather. In this case, rainfall at that time of year, if it was cold and rainy, it affected survival. So even in the absence of predators, death happens for fawns. You really need to, to manage deer at an all-encompassing holistic level. And one of the best ways you can do that if you're not getting good recruitment is just lay off your doe harvest. And, and that's probably the best take home message I can share with you. Number 17, uh, we know that private lands and QDM co-ops are really important. How important? Roughly 22% of the US is either leased or owned, uh, Luke McCauley found, for some kind of wildlife associated recreation. And hunting was by far the most widespread use, 81% of that total. So almost 350 million acres in the US is owned or leased by people for hunting. Huge, huge numbers. Um, and there's some information there about spending that I'll, I'll breeze over to, to keep for the sake of time. Um, we also know that QDM cooperatives, which if you've been following QDMA for a long time, we've been talking about cooperatives for many years. They're very important. And what kind of benefits do those give to private landowners? Well, Michigan State, uh, Anna Mitterling in 2016, and Hunter Pruitt from University of Georgia in 2018 showed us really just how important they are. Anna found that um, hunters that are on cooperatives are more satisfied and they're more swayed by their neighbors, of course. And Hunter found that wildlife habitat is just more diverse um, on co-ops than on surrounding lands. And he studied that in four states. And I'll show you some of the results. In terms of hunting satisfaction, satisfaction changed and the difference for people when they were pre and going into a co-op in the Michigan state st uh, study from 45% of the hunters were sat satisfied with their hunting to 80% huge jump there and compared to other parts of the, the similar hunters in the same part of that region. Um, Anna also found that we influence our neighbors, we influence our family more than we realize. So just by communicating with people that you hunt with and asking them and, do, ask, uh, and showing by example of what you do, passing up young bucks, doing habitat management, making sure that you're shooting does in the, ex in the example of this graph, will influence, it's just peer pressure, your neighbors and your friends. So keep sending those positive messages and telling people what you're doing, even if you're not in a formal co-op because it works. And here's a really cool graphic from Hunter's study that he measured almost 200,000 acres in 35 co-ops over four states um, and looked at the differences in diversity on the landscape of where hunters were managing in a co-op situation versus the neighboring lands where it wasn't. And it was just so much more uh, diversity because those people were really working the land over to try to improve things. And we talked about that a lot earlier. All right, Kip, two more, three more. Public versus private land survival. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, Jacob House reported the difference of uh, yearling buck survival for public versus public uh, private lands captured 61 yearling bucks. This was done in Delaware as well, followed them and whether they were shot, whether it was public or private land and found that when the bucks lived primarily on private land, about 75% of them survived. We're talking about yearling bucks, okay? The first year buck, even though local regulations allowed them to shoot anything. Um, this was, was not necessarily in a place of high QDM. You could shoot anything you want. Um, it's 37% that went on public land uh, survival. So only 37. So there's a stark difference there. People on private land, we know that generally most people that hunt deer in this country uh, practice QDM. We've done some surveys. We think it's close to, to 80% of all hunters practice some form of QDM. Um, we also know that most people hunt on private land. So this made a lot of sense, but it also showed some numbers to what those survival rates may be, at least in the Eastern Shore and Delaware specifically, what it might be. About three quarters of young bucks survive on private land, in, even in the absence of, of regulations that would, would mandate it. Number 19, 
we know that QDM works. Um, you know, duh, right? But lots of studies here since 2010 that showed, in particular, I'm going to cite one over 15 years that showed that buck age structure increases. We saw that not much changes in terms of overall harvest. You're not going to shoot less deer by doing something like this. Productivity remains really stable. Um, deer weights remain stable, if not go up. Um, see more deer. Fawn recruitment typically goes up. And we also see that people not only see more deer, but their hours and success rates go up. Observation rates go up in terms of what they're seeing from mature bucks. And at the end of this study, almost 100% of the people in this one were, were more satisfied than they were at the beginning. So what we learned across the suite of studies is, of course, QDM programs produce an older buck age structure. This is science-based, so it's showing you it works maintains the doe age structure, increases per hunter harvest, maintains a healthy deer herd with ha within the habitat, and reduces the effort to observe deer, and it also makes us happier. And that's why we've promoted QDM uh, for over 30 years at the QDMA is because it's a great thing and it works. Hashtag QDM works, right, Lindsay? And then finally, although QDM works, we know that culling does not work. Um, lots of studies uh, have been in and around this. The most recent one, which is what I'm going to profile, um, is out of Texas. Donnie Drager presented some really cool data at our 2018 convention. Um, this was on a 100,000 acre uh, free range. It wasn't a high fence situation. Over 10 years um, in South Texas on the Comanche Ranch, they followed this by doing three treatments a control where they did nothing, uh, had an intensive culling effort and a moderate culling effort. And they captured and removed, basically sacrificed deer that did not meet their culling criteria, uh, over 5,000 deer over that time. Um, uh, they culled about 1,300 uh, deer in seven years. Um, and they also recaptured about 2,500 deer. Um, and you, they assign parentage. So the, what they learn from that is when they do a really intensive culling effort, you actually cr crash the buck population. They remove so many bucks that bucks basically were in absence in that population in the, in the criteria that they set. In the moderate, uh, where they kind of somewhat did culling and removed deer of certain things. They saw no effect and this graph shows this. Even over those years, 2006 and seven, 2008 and nine, 2010 and 12, the moderate and controlled states separated and there were really not that much of a difference. And even at, at this scale, it was decreasing where the culling effort was making deer, if you wanted to say it, get smaller from the 130s to the high 120s. What they attributed all that to was looking at antlers is, the only way we know how to cull. We look at bucks, people talk about it on social media, they post pictures and they say, he needs to be culled. They're looking at the antlers when they say that. Well, one, we don't know how to cull a doe. They contribute 50% of the genes. And they also found that antlers do not equal breeding value. Some bucks with big antlers actually produce very small offspring. Um, they followed this, they did parentage and had DNA tests. Some bucks that had moderate to small antlers actually produce really big antler offspring. Just so just by looking at antlers does not allow us to do that. So the reason for, for culling is just, it doesn't hold water. So that's my top 20, uh, a long list of honorable mentions because there's lots and lots of research out there, things that have to do with uh, camera surveys and some of the variation in breeding in the south and why it's so crazy. Um, other predator influences like at foraging behavior and vigilance. I think that's some really neat research that's been done looking at how when even in the when there's predators there it really impacts deer behavior. It impacts um, how they group up, um, how much they're paying attention to predators and not paying attention to their health and some other things. So lots of honorable mentions. I'd be available if anybody uh, wants to reach out. We're going to have some Q&A here if I didn't take up too much, too much time. Um, but if you don't want to um, come back and watch the recording of this, which Kip is recording, the next issue of the magazine is going to have um, a feature about basically what I just talked about. So if you're not a member, join because you'll be able to read a lot of the stuff that I just talked about there. And I want to appreciate everybody's time. And uh, thank you very much. All right. Well, well, thank you, Matt. I want you to go ahead and uh, stop viewing your screw or stop sharing the screen.
Uh, you actually did pretty good. I, I didn't get many, well, I took some notes on some of the cool stuff, but as far as things that you actually mixed up on, uh, do, do you want to hear a couple of them? Sure. Hey, well, first of all, do you know Luke McCauley is now uh, at the University of Maryland? I didn't. He is. He's back east now, so he's no longer at Berkeley. He's actually here in the east doing deer research at the University of Maryland. That's pretty cool. Talked to a guy from the University of Maryland last week uh, about Luke and uh, the, some of the, the new stuff they're doing with some diversion strips and some other food-related deer stuff. So uh, that's pretty cool. But uh, you, uh, you're you really good with a bunch of the research. You're obviously good at finding that stuff and reciting it. Not as good at math, though. You what I do? <laughs> 20 of these. And at number 17, you said two to go. So, uh, oh, I know, I know. It's not even big numbers. There was little numbers. Um, so, but that was a simple one. Uh, yeah. The dispersion, excursion thing, that was a little bit of a faux pas. Um, I think you might have been trying to look at a text or something because you looked like you just really weren't paying attention to the crowd at that point. You just kind of got lost a little bit. But uh, I think probably the biggest faux pas the whole time that caught me that I just, you know, like buzzers went off, was uh, I don't think Aldo Leopold, ever referred to uh, to deer pellets or scat as deer poop. So to hear wow. a, a, a critically acclaimed deer biologist such as yourself, to refer to it as that, I know your young daughters are to bed now. There's no little kids. You're not doing like a mentoring thing with youth. That just sounded really funny the way you said that. So, uh, I appreciate it. You, you want to know the biggest faux pas? I spilled my beer in the middle of that, and nobody knew that. It actually just dropped on my on my lap. But uh who knows? All right. We got to give a, we're going to do some Q&A here. First, though, we have a giveaway. Um, given that Onyx is a, is a major sponsor of QDMA, uh, we are giving away a premium Onyx membership tonight. Matt showed you that the CWD layer in their, uh, in their app, and actually that's a free layer for anybody, um, but this isn't just a general membership, but a premium membership to Onyx. And now the way you're going to win this is uh, through the chat feature, the first person that chats or answers this correctly in the chat feature, um, we will send you this premium membership. And now uh, this is from Matt's talk tonight. So uh, um, it was kind of early in the talk. It was one of the last ones. But I think this is very critical to the whole, uh, you know, understanding uh, the QDM uh, management philosophy. And it ties in perfectly with the last thing he said about calling. Aaron Foley from uh, Cesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute said, uh, you know, even in populations that have really good age structure of bucks, um, even in those when you have lots of three, four, five, and six-year-old bucks, what percentage of fawns are still sired by bucks that are only, I haven't even got the answer on, I, or the question, I've seen the answer already. What percentage of bucks or fawns are still sired by young bucks? So it's one and two, and uh, it is 33%. Uh, I'll have to scroll back up now to see who got it first, but uh, I think that's pretty cool, and it's just a function of how deer breed. You know, it's not like elk where we have long breeding seasons and harems, so uh, very short. So uh, it's just, uh, you know, who happens to be right there. You don't have to be the oldest buck in the mountain or in the woods just as long as uh, you're the only buck there in some cases. So uh, that just was one more thing that really ties home Matt's message regarding culling doesn't work, and uh, that's one more reason why. So, uh, hey, with that... Um, Couple things I want to mention before we uh, we get into this uh, the Q and A. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the commentary that we're doing here. Um, please send us uh, any uh, comments you have, suggestions for the future, or whatever. I'm glad we finally got the uh, the chat feature working, so everybody could have an opportunity to to converse with each other. But uh, if you're a QDMA member, thank you very much for uh, for being one. If you're not, uh, it's a perfect time to join. And actually, even if you are, it's a perfect time to renew because at qdma.com uh, forward slash member drive, we have a membership drive. We have a current drive going on that if you join or renew, you get your name and a, a raffle for some really, really cool prizes. So perfect time to join or renew, go do that. Uh, if you like cool stuff, uh, we announced a, a new raffle today, a Yeti mystery raffle. You can uh, win one of three Yeti coolers that are full of prizes. One of them has a gun in it, uh, including a, a bunch of other cool stuff. Uh, there's at least 18 prizes there, so this is not one of those empty Yeti things. Uh, this is a full Yeti, all three of them. Just some of them are, are, are full with more cool stuff than others. But a great way uh, to, to be able to help us out. Um, what do you think, Matt? How to feel did it go for you? Feel pretty cool? Pretty good. I wish I could see everybody's face. That's one of the things that presenting uh, live is uh, you get to see uh, people's reaction when you tell certain things. But uh, otherwise... Um, I'm glad that uh, we were able to provide a lot of this data uh, for everybody. It's, it's, to me, you know, growing up 
hunting and getting into the field because of hunting. This is what I really wanted to learn about when I went to school. And uh, we do, we, we try every time we come out with something that's content for, for you all, whether you're a member or not, um, in our magazine, on our website, and try to bring the take home message to hunting. Um, or if you're trying to improve your chances of hunting by doing management on, on your land. And there's one of the cool things about the research in the last couple of years is I, I think there are more researchers out there that are thinking the same question. So it's less about physiology um, and more about how do we change things to make our situation better. And we've really seen that in the last decade, looking through all those proceedings, which, which was make it, made a lot more fun for me to give that presentation. Good deal. Jared Brooke was the, the winner. Uh, the first one to get in 33. There was a pile of people who no. answered 33 percent. And uh, and I really like uh, the one answer here that said, uh, I actually had it right first. Uh, my internet is slower than Jared's. I would have beat him to the punch. I love the humor. I, I like uh, the old college try with that. So uh, um, if folks have uh, questions here, I'm getting lots of really good uh, uh, reports from folks, Matt. Uh, they liked your presentation. They liked the information. Uh, they liked the format that we had here tonight. Some folks saying that the deaf will be here next time, that they are they're going to join. That's awesome. Uh, one of the questions we have is, uh, what is the, and as I said, uh, what's the minimum cleared area required to be able to gain up to 60% acorn production? So when you're opening up an oak forest, uh, what are we looking at? And I'm guessing this is a canopy opening. Uh, to be able to get that 60% acorn boost that you referenced? Well, I, I, let me an, I'll answer. And then if Jared wants to say something in the chat feature, since he's on here and he won, since you won that on X thing, you can, you can give people an answer. But um, one of the things they found was that within one year, those crowns can actually increase 25%, I believe the number was. Um, so if you can picture whatever the crown size is for the tree um, within, within a year or, or one growing season, it's going to increase 25%. So you'd want to open it up probably three times the canopy of that individual tree to make, make enough room um, to, to have an effect for more than one season. You want to be able to, to grow that. So um, that might be, mean removing more than one tree right next to it, um, but just use by eye. I mean, obviously every single situation is going to be different depending on what trees are there, but look for a space of probably somewhere between 30 and 50 feet. What do you think, Jared? Jared, I unmuted you if you want to answer that as well. Hey, I got it. I don't know if he's right or wrong. Yeah. Thanks for know, the uh, Onyx membership. I, I promise I didn't know the question beforehand. So we're all good there. Um, what we did was just, we just removed basically all the trees that were around that oak tree that were competing with it. So if, it, if its crown was touching the other, the other crown, of the oak tree, we took it out. So that's probably 30, 50 feet is probably pretty good. Just enough to give that crown some room to grow. Good deal. Thank you, Jared. Thanks, hey, Jared. we got a question about mowing. Um, James asked, uh, and first of all, hey, James, good to hear from you. Um, if, we, if we clip our perennial clover and alfalfa plots only once a year, does it affect palatability? Not at all. Not at all. And uh, that's good to only clip them once a year. I'll tell you, a lot of where that people used to think that uh, – nutritional value greatly increased as you know you talk to farmers and second cutting hay is always higher quality i grew up on a farm i'm, I'm well versed in talking with farmers on this the reason for that is because the second cutting hay you're only measuring you only have the stem content is so much lower so your leaf to stem ratio which basically the cows are eating is so much higher well when we're talking deer stuff in most cases they are not eating those stems so that does work in farming when you have cows eating a lot of stemming material, entirely different situation with deer where they are basically eating the leaves only anyway. So that is why with deer, you do not get a boost in nutritional quality by all of that repeated cutting. So uh, no, one clipping a year to keep uh, the, the weed seeds out is, is perfect. Um, you're not losing palatability by any means. And as Matt showed, uh, if you mow uh, clover, alfalfa, or any of those multiple times, you are not gaining any nutritional uh, capability, you are only just losing total biomass. So uh, slow down on the slow down on the mowing machines. Uh, lots of great info stuff. One thing about future topics uh, next month uh, in October. So uh, the second Monday is uh, is October twelfth. I will be talking about uh, deer behavior and movement patterns, and specifically talking about the October lull. Is it a, is that true? Is that a reality? You know, is it a myth? What is that? 
figure October is a perfect time for that. So we're going to cover lots of cool deer stuff. Um, November, um, we we have the speaker lined up. We have the perfect talk for that night. One small glitch, he may have a prior commitment. So uh, it's going to be deer related. It's going to be rut related. It's going to be super cool. I can't announce it yet until he confirms uh, his. He can get out of his prior commitment, or he we have to pick him a different month. But I will say in uh, December, we have Mark Kenyon from the Meat Eater will be here to talk about uh, a small property case study, uh, what he has learned uh, on the Meat Eater Back 40. For any of you that follow a Meat Eater, uh, the show that they have, super popular, really cool info based out of, uh, or I'll video it out of Michigan. Mark will be our guest in December. Uh, Craig, Dr. Craig Harper will be on soon after the new year. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a whole bunch of others as well. But uh, um, that's a little sneak peek anyway about uh, some of what we have coming up. So uh, um, what do we have here? We'll, see, we'll, we'll take a couple more questions. And then, uh, Nick, I'll turn it back over to you and let you uh, bid everybody uh, a farewell uh, for the evening. The final words, we can do that. Um, what we have, oh, let's see. Something regarding Minnesota. So it says uh, preliminary results come out of Minnesota's deer dispersal study. A uh, certain percentage of young deer are dispersing extremely long distances. Uh, how does this impact CWD management? Actually, you know what? That study is, is very unique in that a lot of the dispersal studies show that a much higher percentage of, of yearling bucks disperse. In most cases, half to three quarters of those bucks that are 12 to 18 months old disperse. Uh, a smaller percentage of, of yearling does do. However, the, the stuff out of Minnesota thus far is showing almost equal numbers of bucks and does one and a half year olds that are dispersing. So um, that absolutely has uh, issues related to, to disease management. Um, we know that bucks are, are more likely to have the disease. However, does um, act as CWD reservoirs. Um, just the way that the deer react, you know, does stay together, live in familial groups, grandmothers, mothers, daughters, aunts, all together. Um, research out of Wisconsin shows that if a, a an adult doe is CWD positive. Um, her kin or her relative that live nearby are 10 times more likely to be CWD positive. So what happens is in those doe groups, once you get CWD, it becomes a reservoir for it and we can't get rid of it. So in Minnesota, where those yearling does are dispersing at much higher rates than in many other places, there's the, the chance there that they can then take that disease and move it to a new area. So uh, really cool research that, that, that they have going on there. Kudos to the Minnesota DNR and those researchers uh, to, to be looking at that. Um, but uh, yeah, really good stuff coming out of there. So, uh, well, I think that looks like the end of the questions there. We're uh, a little later than, than we had hoped. So uh, how about we have some final words and uh, let them all go home and go to bed, Nick. Uh, I'll turn it over to you and uh, let you close it out for us. Yeah, great job, guys. Uh, it, was, it was fun for me and I hope it was for the audience as well. Uh, yeah, we didn't get to every single question as I'm looking down the list here. Uh, email us. Like I said, we're, it's part of the culture here. Uh, we want to talk with you directly. Email us. You can find our email addresses on the QDMA website, and we'll get you some answers back if we didn't get it tonight. Hey, tell your friends about this. Get them out uh, to, to check out the show. And uh, there's a lot of great information here. And I think, uh, you know, we, we want all of our deer hunters to be as well-rounded as possible. And that doesn't mean uh, just knowing what the latest new gear is and the latest tactics. Uh, understanding the science and the research is pretty cool, too. So, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and call it a good evening. Thank you again for joining us. Looking forward to uh, these in the future and interacting with you, our, our members and supporters. Have a great evening, everybody. Thanks, Nick. Good job, Matt. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.